astronomer Carl Sagan uh, once compared uh, the whole historical account of the biosphere, uh, which goes back in time for billions of years, with a single human day. The idea was to try to put ourselves in a context that we can actually imagine. And what he said is that, you see all this biosphere that's been emerging, appear at some point in the middle of the year, and just at the end of that year, in the last second, we emerge as a species. So we're just newcomers. And over the last 10,000 years, uh, we have been enjoying an amazingly stable climate. It's called the Holocene. After the last big glaciation event, so the, this um, this uh, long time uh, window of nice weather, not too hot, not too um, cold, with seasons that we start to forget nowadays, um, we see the emergence of uh, a civilization that has been so successful because the nice climate allowed us to build agriculture, large cities, technology, and everything has been okay until the last 200 years, where this newcomer species has been uh, modifying the, the, the climate by means of using fossil fuels in a scale that has led into unprecedented changes. Um, this can be summarized quite well by the famous uh, hockey, hockey stick diagram. In this diagram, what we show is what we have been able to infer about average temperatures over the last thousand years. And as you, as you can see here, if you look at both at estimated carbon dioxide levels, average temperatures, everything has been quite fine, quite good for us. But from the Industrial Revolution, things have been going in the, the wrong direction. Um, and the problem, as you can see here very well, is that uh, CO2 increase, uh, higher temperatures, this is accelerating at a unique way. It's unprecedented. And when I'm saying unprecedented is that you check the fossil record of life, and you see that there has been uh, periods of time where temperatures were high, right, remarkably high, but nothing like this, right? This is accelerating very quickly. And climate scientists have been predicting this for a very long time, right? What we are seeing these days, these uh, enormous floods, mega fires, that was predicted more than 30 years ago. So um, this is a serious situation because also everything points into the direction that there are feedbacks that are connected one with the other. Large mega fires means that you inject enormous amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, you get into a situation where the forest is gone, you need maybe 50 years or 100 years to recover, right? Whereas the, C the new CO2 is there. So the problem is not only this. The problem is um, when you look at ecosystems, and ecosystems are the reason we are here, um, the predicted changes in time are not going to be smooth. That's a considerably different picture from our intuition. Our intuition says, OK, things are going bad. Um, when things are really bad, we'll do something to recover and somehow solve the problems. The problem is that things are not like that. Uh, and for example, we know from evidence and from a lot of modeling that, for example, uh, the case study I want to bring today, drylands, which is 40% of ecosystems on our planet. Don't think in deserts. Think in places where you have vegetation, right? You vegetation allows water to be sustained. And more than a third of the human population lives in drylands. Okay? And evidence points into the direction that as you increase temperature, as you increase degradation of soils, as you stress more and more, the response is not going to be smooth. It's not like a continuum decline is going to be sharp and catastrophic. So that changes a lot of our, our perception of risk, right? Risk is not something we can take um, um, in a way, like in a linear way, right? It's not a linear thing. So, so far, uh, everything is negative, okay? 
so it can be done. Uh, of course, uh, let me say that I, I'm not going to propose that just a technological fix is the key. We, we need to change a lot of things, right? Uh, from the perspective of the way uh, the way we waste materials, the way we mismanage energy. Um, there's one proposal, which is geoengineering. So um, as a technological fix, there's a lot of people thinking in how do you can fix more CO2, extract CO2 and fix and kind of uh, sequester this uh, gas from the atmosphere. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of ingenuity here, um, but so far, so bad, because it's, it's really not, the numbers don't, don't go well, right? It's, no, it's, no, it's not at all any kind of thing that suggests that this is a solution for the next decades to solve the problem. It's a lot of uh, ideas there, from fixation of CO2 uh, to building millions of mini satellites with mirrors that will deflect the light of the sun, to gigantic machines that will create steam to change the amount of clouds, right? None of these solutions solves the big problem, which is CO2. These are kind of solutions that won't, won't aim at decreasing the temperature of the planet, right? Nobody knows if it works. So what's the alternative? We proposed in my lab now some years ago uh, an idea that, as you will see in a moment, is controversial which is the following. Uh, let's not go into geoengineering. Let's go into bioengineering, right? Bioengineering meaning what? Well, we need to build, if we want to go to the geoengineering, we need to build the machines, right? We need to invest money, build the machines. Imagine in a, in a apparently uh, dream world that the machines build themselves, okay? That's the idea. The idea is imagine that I could use synthetic biology, so genetic engineering, to create microorganisms that are artificial in a sense, that can be used actually to fight some of the problems derived from climate change. Microorganisms replicate themselves. You don't have to build them, right? They just expand. And one of the cases of studies I was mentioned before is drylands. Drylands, I must say, when I was started to, to work on that, I thought this is a boring thing. This is not like the, like the rainforest, isn't it? But it turns out that when you look closely, along with the plant cover, it's few plants, it's patchy vegetation, you have all this soil, which is an amazingly complex ecosystem and responsible for CO2 flows. Um, it's responsible for, for a lot of the stability that we enjoy. And it's, in a way, it's kind of a rainforest. The idea is, imagine I take a microorganism from this microbial ecosystem, or what we call the microbiome, right? The microbiome needs to be understood as a network. It's a many species, right? It's a whole diverse ecosystem, and biodiversity here is a main point, right? You see why. And I can paint one of these ecosystems. Every sphere here is a species. Every link means that it's an interaction. And the idea is, I choose someone from here, a species that is already in the community. Why? Because it has been co-evolving with everyone else, right? And I want to maintain biodiversity, so I want to preserve ecosystem architecture. So this is not standard engineering. It's not like the top-down idea of I'm going to change everything and I know what's happening, right? I know every single thing I have managed to engineer. What I want to do is choose one species, modify it, and one of the candidates is cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria, actually, if you check in the literature, has have been enormously important to change the climate of the planet. So microorganisms are a great candidate. In soil ecosystem in drylands, they play a an in, import, very important role. They are what's called ecosystem engineers. They are responsible for controlling flows of matter and energy. The idea is, take one of these species, I modify, doing what? Imagine I put a gene that uh, makes a protein or a polysaccharide, some, some polymer that goes outside and is able to, pres to uh, retain a little more moisture. Little more sounds not much, but it's a lot, right? Because these systems amplify a lot everything. So the idea is if I find out in this small scale network of genes, right? There will be a representation. Here the spheres are genes, connections are interactions between genes. The dream is I change something in the architecture of these circuits, right? I return, I deploy 
the microorganism, and I should observe that things change. This is in part inspired in things that are going on in biomedical research. Right? It's not a single experiment isolated from everything else. In, in biomedicine, it's a whole, now it's a whole research now about changing our microbiomes, the microbiomes you have inside, and they're responsible for diseases. Okay? So that's the big point. Changing something that is already there, that preserves biodiversity, because biodiversity is what warranties ecosystem health, but put a function there that is new. If I improve soil quality, I improve the amount of vegetation, and the vegetation improves the population of my microorganism. It's a symbiotic loop. So here we are. We are in a situation where we might be close to the tipping point. We don't know how much. right? Things have to be done. And you might think, well, you're suggesting to use microorganisms to uh, try to solve something that happens on the planetary scale. Isn't it this impossible? Right? It's like maybe like a dream. Well, I like what Irene Vallejo says about that. The impossible must be dream first to one day make it a reality. Thank you.